Well, hello everybody. It's Peter Lindstrom from the Clean Energy Resource Team. I work with local governments and schools with CERTs or the Clean Energy Resource Team. And you are here to learn about green building policies and what cities are doing uh, along those lines. So before we head into the, the details of uh, uh, this best practice, I want to encourage the Green Step coordinators to fill out their survey. You should have recently received uh, an email that uh, is talking about the Green Step survey. This is an annual survey that we send out. It takes maybe 15 minutes or so for coordinators to complete, and uh, it is really helpful for, um, for how we uh, format this Green Step initiative for cities. So please consider filling out that survey. So for those of you tuning in, um, this is what you're going to be learning about in uh, the next two hours. First of all, uh, we have the best practice advisor for this particular best practice, Flora Milberg, <clears throat> talking about what cities can and cannot do when it comes to the, the uh, code. And then we're going to hear some, some case studies. First from Kirk Schultz from the City of St. Paul, and uh, then Sean Sinwell from the City of Maplewood. And last but not least, uh, Leah Hineker from Hennepin County is going to be talking about a, a really innovative <clears throat> initiative that Hennepin County is launching for cities uh, that want to partake in this benchmarking initiative. Really, cities across Minnesota are invited to participate with Hennepin County for benchmarking uh, private buildings in their locations. So when I was thinking about uh, this workshop, uh, I was thinking about, well, why do we have this best practice in the first place? What are some of the benefits for having green buildings? And clearly, there's a lot of environmental benefits. Um, these benefits are measured in, in gigatons worth of uh, potential uh, carbon savings across the state, across the nation. And clearly, there's economic benefits as well. <clears throat> there's a lot of statistics out there about, uh, about how lease rates are more beneficial um, in green buildings, uh, how the, the resale value is better in green buildings, et cetera. But there's three statistics around the social aspects of green buildings that, that really stood out for me. And <clears throat> this was a some Harvard researchers took a look at this question of the benefits of green buildings and, and concluded that workers in green, well-ventilated offices record a 101% increase in cognitive scores. And employees in offices with windows slept an average of 46 minutes more per night. And finally, research suggests that better indoor air quality can lead to improvements in performance of up to 8%. So the incentives for having a green building policy, first, you're really helping Mother Nature. Uh, no question about that. You have more dollars in your pocket. There's economic benefits. But you're going to work smarter. You're going to be more productive and get a better night's rest. So clearly some very beneficial uh, aspects of a green building policy. So with that, this is the best practice, number three out of your 29 best practices. Construct new buildings to meet or qualify under a green building framework. And when I read this, I thought, well, what exactly does a, the word framework mean in this, in this area. And what it means is a code or an ordinance or a standard um, or a certification program like LEED might, might be the most uh, well-known of, the, of these certification programs. And, my, and when I say standard, I mean things like um, a policy whereby a city says, um, 
do three out of these five things and we will grant you uh, and do three out of these five things uh, in order to be granted uh, a plan unit development or a conditional use permit or, or something along those lines or tax abatement or TIF. Um, these, these types of, um, these types of uh, city initiatives or, or um, uh, city programs that are already in place like planned unit developments or, or uh, conditional use permits just kind of re-swizzling them in a different way to meet your sustainability goals. So from this best practice, the first two are really uh, public facing, like um, your own city facilities or working with your schools. And uh, three, four, and five are private building focused and, and those are uh, the action items in this best practice that we're gonna focus on uh, here in the next hour and a half, two hours. Before we move on to the other presenters this morning, um, first of all, we have great presenters from, from Maplewood, from St. Paul, um, really the cream of the crop. Also, City of Duluth is doing some innovative things. They could not join us uh, today, but I want to call them out because they are really doing some, some cool things and they, they've had a green building policy in place for about eight years or so. They've had dozens of buildings go through uh, this, this policy. They have not had any projects come to a halt um, because of this policy. And um, I wanted to relay some information from the city of Duluth to you this morning. And um, so just some lessons learned that they sent my way. Um, and first of all, this is, this is the individual to contact for more information about this. Um, but some lessons learned from their green building policy include that you should continually reevaluate whether the policy is working or not. So work with local architects and engineers who embrace sustainability and tap into the experience uh, from your local building code officials. Number two, have a really clear definition of the terms. So terms uh, that, they did, that they didn't expect to be confusing like brownfield sites and uh, a previously used site and landscape area. Um, you want really clear definitions of what you're talking about. Also, uh, they made a point of saying, be sure to work with your elected officials on the front end uh, as you're developing this, this policy. Um, and it's even beneficial, or especially beneficial, if it's worked into other um, city planning documents like the comprehensive plan so that you can point to the comp plan and saying, hey, you have these goals, uh, here's a specific action item that we can take that'll help us meet that, that specific goals. And enlist your local architects and engineers to demonstrate support for this project. So here are some resources uh, that uh, will be beneficial to you as you're moving forward with developing your, your green building policy. Lots of great information online. We have model ordinances on the Green Step website uh, for green buildings and we have one that uh, specifically related to planned unit development, one related to energy efficiency. Uh, so I think you'll find those helpful. And then there's there's two things on the Environmental Protection Agency's website which are beneficial as well. First of all they have a toolkit, a sustainable design and green building toolkit that I found to be useful. And then they also have uh, a really slick uh, table that lays out the different um, green building standards. So again, I mentioned LEED, or, uh, uh, LEED as uh, uh, perhaps the most uh, popular one of those standards. But there's a number of them out there and this table 
outlines what those standards uh, do and do not do. So I think that's all I have for you this, this morning, today, and uh, we'll continue on with the webinar. Updated in January 2018, it's now an ordinance. Um, it was a policy that was made uh, possible through a grant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Specific uh, accolades and thanks to Laura <laughs> Milberg uh, for your hands-on uh, work to make this all possible. Um, the state was interested in developing a model policy that other municipalities could replicate uh, either in its entirety or portions of it. So that was uh, foremost, uh, top and foremost in our mind as we were developing the policy over a two-year period. Um, and so it's, uh, what we did is we made the policy scalable. So uh, as we go through, you'll see that uh, you can add things to it, take away to make it fit uh, a municipality of, of your size. Um, one of those things is the trigger, uh, the dollar threshold. As Laura was saying, municipalities are prohibited by the state from uh, having building requirements that exceed the state's code. Um, the exception to that is when you invest into uh, invest dollars into a project, and St. Paul invests in a lot of projects uh, in St. Paul. And so, um, for example, this one, Hamlin Station, is on University Avenue, just down the road. Um, we invest in a lot of affordable housing uh, in St. Paul, and when a developer receives more than two hundred thousand dollars in St. Paul, they're required to comply with this policy, and then. Uh, cities of different sizes, maybe cities that invest less in a project or don't invest at all, uh, could scale this differently to, to find a trigger that, that they can use. In St. Paul, the policy applies to new construction. It also applies to um, projects uh, of existing buildings in which there is additional square footage added and a new mechanical system. And I if you're interested, I can explain the rationale behind that. Um, we just added uh, in 2018 major renovations of 10,000 square feet or more. Again, if there's a, a new mechanical system or HVAC, so that should expand the number of buildings or increase the number of buildings dramatically that will have to comply with with this policy. Uh, this is Kendall's Ace Hardware on the east side, one of the earlier projects to comply. You'll see as we go through that this policy uh, uh, hits all sorts of all sorts of development. Um, so the policy structure, there are two main parts to it, um, two key steps. Comply with the green building standard from the eligible list, and I'll go over that list in a, in a moment. Um, comply with and be certified through that green building standard. and comply with the St. Paul overlay, and I'll go into detail about that. The overlay uh, is a list of about 10 or 12 items that uh, each project must comply with regardless of what standard is followed. So these, this is the approved list of green building standards. The concept here was, um, first of all, uh, again, it was a two-year process that we, we used to develop this policy, and uh, we came up with this process. Uh, at the time, it was unique. Uh, we're not familiar with any other city that had done this, but um, one option was to develop our own standard, which when we started digging in, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense because there were so many quality, comprehensive standards, including these that we could choose from, just take off the shelf that people were already familiar with. Um, secondly, we wanted to give developers some flexibility uh, rather than, you know, some cities around the country have said, you need to build to lead silver. Uh, we thought, well, let's give the developers some flexibility, especially when you consider that other funders have different requirements already. So, so for example, Minnesota housing requires that builders use uh, green communities with something called the Minnesota overlay. If a developer receives uh, state bonding dollars, they need to comply with B3. So it didn't make a lot of sense to us to say both you need to do B3 and LEED, or you need to do green communities and LEED. You can choose one of the green building standards. But we also understood that not all of these standards were 
identical. They had, each one of them had strengths and weaknesses. And so that gave birth to the idea of creating a St. Paul overlay. And of course, your city can, doesn't need to call it the St. Paul overlay. You, know, <laughs> you could call it the St. Paul overlay. Uh, but we identified uh, about a, you know, a dozen different requirements that regardless of what standards you follow, you need to do this. And so it creates a new floor, a new minimum in each of these areas. Um, the list that we started with was dozens. You know, we had night sky, we had all sorts of things that we thought were a priority in St. Paul, and we needed to keep winnowing that down to something that was manageable, both for developers as well as city staff that need to, you know, ensure compliance. So behind each one of these items, predicted and actual energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, use of potable water both inside the building as well as outside of the building, uh, utilization of renewable energy, that's a new one in 2018. Uh, electric vehicle charging capability, so it's like EV charging ready. We're not requiring the actual installation of the stations. Uh, diversion of construction waste, indoor environmental quality, stormwater management, resilient design, and ongoing actual energy and water use. Behind each one of these bullets, we have specific requirements. So, for example, on the construction waste diversion, it's 75% of the construction waste needs to be diverted from landfills and incinerators. The, back to here, predicted, and an, do that again, predicted annual energy use, uh, we use the state's SB 2030 requirement uh, for that. And so each one of them has a very precise, measurable uh, requirement uh, behind it. Um, and then, just to give you a little idea of what the project, or excuse me, what the policy has applied to, it's nearly 60 projects, uh, over 3 million total square feet in St. Paul are complying with the uh, with the policy. That represents over a half a billion dollar of half a billion dollars of total investment. Um, and as you can see, the types of projects. This one may be familiar with the, to people. It's the CHS field. Um, uh, which received state bonding dollars and also was a city project. Oh, let me back up, uh, kind of fundamental. The policy applies to all city buildings, all new con newly constructed or renovated city buildings, as well as private development, as I mentioned, receives more than $200,000. So, you know, we got fire stations and rec centers and, and city buildings as well as private development. So we have multifamily uh, from affordable to luxury, uh, commercial, as you saw the hardware store earlier. Uh, we have the grocery store, restaurant um, venues like the Ordway Center for Performing Arts, as well as CHS Field, uh, community centers, a, uh, a shelter, and so forth. So it really does work for all types of projects. And that's because uh, we have that list of sustainable building standards or green building standards. Those also work for a, you know, a variety of different types of construction. And these are just a few pictures of some of the other types of projects that are complying with the policy. This on top is a, a, a shelter for prostituted women and girls. Uh, very small project. It worked for this, uh, or the policy worked for it. Single family or duplex homes also works. Uh, this is a, a rehab uh, project on top, uh, also on University Avenue. It's the uh, old, old home creamery. Uh, or dairy, uh, now uh, affordable housing. Um, this uh, community center and office building for a, a much larger uh, residential project is, uh, is complying. The West Side Flats, one of the first projects, this is an interesting story in that when we put these overlay requirements out there, and the intent was to do something that push the envelope without making it onerous. Uh, we didn't want to disincentivize development in St. Paul, but we wanted people to do something beyond standard operating practices. So one of the questions that came up with this project, one of the first ones was, 
we can't divert 75% of the construction waste. That's, that's just nothing. We, that's not what we do. Well, we figured out, you know, you, you uh, contract with a reputable, reputable hauler, and uh, they went over uh, 80%, and it's the norm now in St. Paul. You, you just don't, you don't do construction if you're not diverting that level of construction waste. Uh, Episcopal Homes, again, on University Avenue for uh, senior living. And uh, this is the Higher Ground Catholic Charities uh, project uh, for uh, homeless uh, residents uh, on the bottom. And that's a pretty picture of our city. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I kind of flew through that. <laughs> yeah. So with uh, single family units, how do they? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. T typically, the city of St. Paul does not invest $200,000 in a single-family home, right? So most of those fall under the under the radar or under the threshold. But if there's a developer who comes in and wants to do a block or two blocks of single-family homes, that's under one development agreement, and then the and then the policy agrees, or excuse me, the policy complies or applies. Um, and so uh, for each one of those standards or each one of those overlay requirements, um, for example, SB 2030, uh, the uh, energy use, there's a small building approach that they've developed to, uh, to help projects like that comply. And then, you know, the, the, the indoor water requirement, for example, is 30% uh, better than the Energy Policy Act of 1992. And so that's very easily uh, scalable for uh, a, a single family building or a large multifamily building. Kurt, I'm curious, <clears throat> nearly 60 projects completed, wide variety of projects. Has there ever been a situation where this policy was waived? Oh, or could they waive it? Good question. Uh, we built into the policy a waiver process. Uh, you need to go to the city council uh, and seek approval for that, and you need to justify it. Uh, kudos to the city council. They have really stood solid on this. They've been very resistant uh, to efforts to uh, waive the policy. And so and under under significant pressure from some developers, I won't name names, um, but they have stood strong. And the only waivers they have granted are the ones that city staff have supported. And those have been on really small projects like a three-season bathroom that the parks is building in a, in a particular park that doesn't have heating or cooling, but isn't exempted from the policy and so they've there is a waiver process but it's only been granted to uh on exceptional cases like that so has the experience <laughs> been that uh developers simply simply uh go out and hire architects uh mechanical engineers who who can just as they do for state bonded buildings that have to perform at the sb 2030 level is the experience that there are um, professionals out there who can build to these standards? And yeah. It's like not a, uh, a uh, like it's not new, it's not impossible, it's not incredibly expensive. Is that so? I'm asking a question about sort of how hard, sort of you know. Uh, right. And again, the intent was to push beyond maybe what the comfort level was, uh, without being onerous, and because of the funding threshold of $200,000, oftentimes these are larger developers and they should either have on their team someone who can design and build to these standards or they need to go out and find them. Uh, a couple of interesting stories related to that. Uh, one is the uh, architect who designed the hardware store, uh, Scott Wendy, uh, has, has now used that experience to design and construct one of the earlier buildings uh, as a selling point, right? He can go out and say, listen, I know how 
to comply with this policy. And now he's done a couple of projects uh, that comply with this policy. Uh, another interesting story is we had a developer who has, has had only done work in Minneapolis come to St. Paul and said, we're not, we're not doing it. We're not complying with that policy. And then the option was, well, then you don't need the financing from the city. Well, okay, we'll, we'll do it. His design team uh, spoke with me off the record um, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is how we want to design buildings. This is how we want to construct buildings. And it's only because of the policy that it's allowed us to push the, the developer to do what we believe the developer ought to be doing. Um, so yes, there are professionals out there who can design and construct to these levels. Uh, you just need to ensure that they're on your team when you enter into an agreement with the city. Laura, I was you, just wondering if there have been any developers that actually decided not to take the I'm familiar with one developer who said they penciled it out and decided to go with $200,000 and not anything above it uh, because they thought it would be cost prohibitive. And so, heck, if, you, if they can make the project work without more public investment, have at it. So you talked about doing the update in 2018, and you mentioned that you'd added renewable energy in at that point. I'm wondering what other changes you made sort of in keeping with the, we want to push the envelope, but not have it be too onerous. What were other things that you might have updated? Uh, so we added uh, three additional requirements to the overlay. One was renewable energy. Uh, one was the EV charging ready. And one uh, that Laura worked uh, specifically on uh, had to do with resilience or resilient design. Uh, and that requirement um, is we identified a number of shocks and stressors that were likely to occur in St. Paul, some dependent on where the, your project might be. So if you're near the river, uh, one of those shocks might be flooding. And so this was more of a narrative uh, requirement where we tell the developer and the design team, tell us what you expect the lead shock and the lead stressor to be, and then tell us how you're going to design to address for that, uh, uh, account for that. Uh, so those were the three new additional requirements. We actually uh, took out uh, a couple of sources of funding that uh, in, under the old policy would have triggered the policy, don't trigger the policy now, and those have to do with uh, cleanup, of, cleanup of polluted properties. We, we believe that cleaning up a polluted property is a good in and of itself, and we didn't think we ought to be adding additional requirements to projects that only received financing for that. Um, Kurt, I, what was the inspiration kind of behind the and mechanical renovation, so like in the existing building world, because you know I think a lot of times, especially in the architectural community, we're used to seeing a lot of these great sustainability standards lead us up in new construction. Mm -hmm. So I really commend you for the fact of bringing in the existing building and mechanical renovation. Yep. So where does that? Come? So we're following the lead of uh, the state. Uh, in, in that. So the B3 green building standard uh, has a, uh, uh, it applies to new construction as well as renovation of 10,000 square feet or, or more. The, the reason we use the new mechanical system as the, as the trigger is um, if someone, someone were to come in and put new flooring in or new siding or new cabinetry, we don't think that's a high enough uh, level of, of uh, renovation to trigger the policy. It's when the new mechanicals come in that there are opportunities to make the building a lot more energy efficient, and the investment is uh, at that point greater or, or great enough to, uh, to warrant something like, like the policy. So that's why we have new mechanicals. In addition, if you're just putting an addition onto your building and it can be served, that addition can be served by the current mechanical system, then we don't think we ought to be
putting this whole policy on top of that project. But once you put in the new mechanical system, that warrants an efficient system and warrants the other requirements that, that are in the policy. Yeah, one more question. Kurt, um, do you have any buildings that have been constructed under this code volunteer or any that have been sent to the Uh I am not aware of any projects trying to pull forward. I, I can't think of any that have, have done it voluntarily. Um, uh, but you know, just, just the ones that have been receiving the, the financing from the city, which keeps my hands really full the way it is. So that's, we, if, if they wanted to do so voluntarily, we, they'd come through our process and we'd, we'd be happy to uh, provide those services that, uh, that I provide and our team provides, but we're pretty busy just dealing with those that need to comply. Yeah, in addition to that question, is the kind of, is the pushback from the, Voluntarily part is that mostly cost prohibitive? Do you think do people perceive this as okay? If I've got a design that's like construct this way, it's a problem. I think that is uh, perhaps the mindset, and I don't think it's uh, necessarily justified. You know, there's been enough studies to to show that uh, the cost for building green ought not be uh, more than building to code. If you if you design the project from day one, understanding what, what the requirements are, what the expectations are. So what I've heard is that zero to 2% uh, in, increase in, in overall costs. Much of that can be recaptured uh, through lower energy costs uh, over time. And because it was a model policy, this is related, um, other cities are, uh, in the process of adopting similar policies or already have Rochester uh, with the Destination Medical Center, similar policy, St. Louis Park, Edina's interested and so forth. And so um, this, again, this can be done at, with different size cities and we'd be happy to provide more information about them. And just to, to the point about coming to voluntarily do the policy, since it involves many certifications, they can just go do lead on their own if they're not getting that money or B3 or, you know, and not have to get involved. Exactly, which we wouldn't even be aware of. Um, it would be the only the overlay portion of the policy that they would they probably come to us to figure that out. Well, I just have a whole point quicker question, but you're requiring um, renewable energy on there. Are you requiring that they put it on their roof, and if their roof is in a flexible that they buy community solar garden, or is there an opt-out version? Right. Uh, so, uh, not <laughs> a question. Uh, but <laughs> we're following, again, on this one, we're following the lead of the state's uh, B3 standards, a 2% requirement. It's on site, and the site, if, 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 if the site's larger than a building, for example, this is happening at Como Park, the site is the park, uh, you can put it any place on the site, but it's 2%. There's a cost effectiveness uh, protocol to it, so it needs to be able to uh, pay for itself within 15 years. And with solar, as you can imagine, the cost of the panels is coming down and the cost of solar is coming down so precipitously uh, that, that that payback is happening quicker and quicker. And we're at the stage now where 15 years is you know, pretty common and so we're going to see a lot more of this happening. So does that? Yeah, no. You're following the B3. And 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 so uh, yes, we're following B3. On site is required, and you can't really buy your way into it through you know either buying RECs or um, doing off site. Oh, not community sale. Yeah. No, distinctly not. So yeah, yes. it's on site. Two percent. But they have a, they have a way out if it's just financial. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, if the site is covered with trees, Tiny, yeah, I mean, trees. <laughs> we're, we're not going to require to put solar on a, in a shaded space. Thank you. Thanks for not doing that. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, 
And just so, so Park Smart is mostly oh, energy okay. efficiency, or is it stormwater, or? Uh, oh, good. Uh, yeah, really good. Park Smart is a relatively new standard. It falls under the U.S. Green Building Council (USGBC) umbrella now. It relates the it relates specifically. Yeah, so USGBC is uh, now the owner of Park Smart, um, and it relates specifically to parking garages, parking structures. Uh, and lots surface? Uh, not lots, I don't think. I think it's structures. Um, no one has used it yet uh, under our policy. It's 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 a new addition under the. Uh, 2018 version, um, and I think it's mostly energy, but it's also efficiency with um, so how quickly people can enter the lot and exactly the navigation of the lot, so you're emitting fewer emissions from the cars driving around looking for a spot and so forth. Cool. All right. It's one of those things that we put in Green Step in 2012 or 13 by the site. Hmm, is this going to get used by anybody? So I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we have, uh, uh, we have the new Kellogg uh, River Center uh, oh. lot that's getting designed. Um, right. And that reminds me, I need to talk to the project manager. <laughs> 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 so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank about our green building code. I always like to start off with, where's Maplewood? <laughs> right? Maplewood is that upside down hockey stick you see on the east side of St. Paul, so we're a first ring suburb of St. Paul. Uh, we do have a population of about 40,000. And um, we're the 23rd largest city in Minnesota. Uh, we have about 40% commercial, or excuse me, residential, 20% um, commercial. Maplewood, uh, we were, I think, one of the first adopters of Green Step Cities, so it's been a great program for us. It's helped guide us along the way of our sustainability initiatives. So I want to thank the MPCA for um, coordinating that because it really has been uh, an asset to our city and meeting our sustainability goals. But we adopted that in 2010, and then since 2017, we've been awarded the Step 5 award, which is currently the, the top award for Green Step Cities program. So um, in our 2040 comp plan, we, for the first time, now have some energy goals. So that was um, something that we worked on last year, uh, creating a resiliency chapter. Actually, we called it sustainability because resiliency is sprinkled throughout the code. Uh, throughout the comp plan, but um, the main goal is to reduce our emissions in all along the state guidelines, uh, to reduce those by, um, of course, the 20% uh, uh, level by 2050. So this would be an 80% reduction. And then we also have some um, energy actions, uh, one being an adopt a climate action and adaptation plan, which we, we will be starting on with our environmental commission this year. And some of those uh, would include, of course, decreasing our citywide greenhouse emissions, um, adding renewable energy sources, and then uh, decrease the urban heat island, especially for those vulnerable populations. So how are we going to do that, you know? <laughs> One thing uh, that we need to really ramp up on is our Maplewood Green Building Code. Now, we did adopt this in 2013, and this was before our energy goal, so we were kind of forward thinking there, but now we're, we really need to start looking at this code and um, doing more incentives, I think, for uh, promoting this. But right now, the code includes five components, and that's energy, water, material usage, indoor air quality, and site management. So this code really looks at the overall site, not just the building envelope itself. So what we did is in uh, 2013, we did uh, adopt the International Green Construction Code, and I brought the big code book for you. So here's our guide for commercial development. 
And then the National Green Building Standard code for residential. So here's the guide here. Looks like a lot of reading material, but the city uh, adopted certain portions of this code um, back in 2013. So why did we adopt this code? Um, the International Green Construction Code we find um, is usable. So uh, our building department and design professionals, you know, we form a partnership when we're looking at development. Uh, the enforceable aspect, um, it has these consistent minimum requirements that are easy to review and enforce. Uh, it is adoptable. Mm -hmm. Jurisdictions can adopt certain portions of the code or leave out certain portions based on your needs. And then adaptable, it allows for geographical differences uh, and flexibility. So in Maplewood, of course, uh, as Laura was indicating, um, we were able to adopt this as a mandatory code for all city buildings and buildings that were funded by the city. Um, we do have an exemption, building construction value less than $200,000, but we still, of course, have that kind of green review by our building department. And then voluntary program with incentives, all private, industrial, and commercial buildings, and then all residential buildings would be exempt from this, but of course we hope to have them voluntarily opt in. So since that time, 2013, we, we have four buildings. Uh, we're not as large as St. Paul, of course, and we don't have that, that much development coming in, but we've had four public, or excuse me, two public buildings uh, built under this code. The South Fire Station, uh, this was the first building constructed. It's actually built on 3M campus property. Uh, it's our newest fire station. And then most recently and currently under construction is our Wakefield community building in uh, Wakefield Park. And then we have two private buildings that are have been constructed under this code. This is in our Gladstone redevelopment neighborhood. And these required uh, to be built under this code because the city of Maplewood did um, offer the tax increment financing for these developments. So it's, um, this is called the um, Frost English Village. Uh, we have 50 apartments, uh, a few of those, a percentage of those are affordable. And then the Frost English uh, Senior Housing, and that's in our Gladstone neighborhood. So the first building, as I stated, that was constructed under this code was the South Fire Station. And this was constructed in 2014. And this building um, has round-the-clock operation with both fire and police personnel in that. So after one year, we did an analysis to see, you know, what did this green construction code do for us? So we looked at the energy usage and um, found that it was using 76.61 kbtu per square foot per year. Um, and we compared that to our other fire stations. At the time, we had fire fire stations in the city of Maplewood. And it was using 38% less energy. Um, now, this is a little old data. We should probably do this again. I'm um, just kind of getting back up and running on the B3 um, now that one of our uh, staff members has left. So I can do another analysis on this. But again, 38% after the first year. So the energy use was 15, or excuse me, the overall operating cost, 15,000 basically a year. So 38% decrease was 5,000 a year. And that's a huge savings for um, a city the size of Maplewood. So you can, you can see it really has paid off just over that first year. So the next building that uh, we are constructing is the Wakefield um, Park building. And this is uh, being, uh, it, the architect was Kimmy Horn. And I had talked to them recently about the city's process and you know what it meant to them in uh, developing, you know, applying for that permit and following all the standards and so forth. And they said it was relatively easy. You know, it just takes a little bit more time to go through the code and determine which performance standards uh, you're going to be implementing. And that um, I also talked to uh, Jason Brash, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. He's our building official. And I said, you know, on your end, uh, what does it take? And he said, well, it's really quite simple. You know, you go through their checklist and you determine if they've met the requirements, the minimum requirements. You know, so it takes a little bit of extra time. 
And then, of course, on the planning end, you know, when we usually look at the stormwater, the trees, um, all those types of things. So it took some more time. It took a little bit more money probably because of that time. Um, and uh, they also discussed uh, the fact that uh, you really need good partners. You know, having a city that's there to be supportive and offer that technical guidance is um, really beneficial. And then, you know, having that contractor uh, that's used to working in that, that realm is um, also a positive. So the Wakefield Park community building is something new. I think a lot of cities are probably seeing this. Um, you need a kind of a space where these smaller gatherings are. So this building holds up to 80 people for, you know, you could uh, rent it out for an event, um, small wedding, something like that. We do have a community center, you know, with banquet space, but this is something different that's intermingled in the community itself. And so this site, you know, it's, um, it's a beautiful site. It's right along Wakefield Lake, you know, so there's some shoreline issues. Uh, there's also wetlands around there, so there's wetland buffer issues. So we wanted to be real sensitive to that, so we looked at the overall site. Again, in this uh, green building code, we can do that. And um, here you can see the building. Uh, we also implemented uh, a new parking lot, um, a skating rink, a picnic shelter. So I asked our building official, Jason Brash, you know, what, what's different about this building? What makes it special? And so he pointed out some of the things that were added to make this kind of a green building. Uh, it's solar ready. It's, uh, the parking lot is EV ready. And, you know, it's so it's, of course, much easier and less expensive to implement that as you're developing it. Um, there's an increase in stormwater management. And uh, currently, you know, we have to, you have to treat 1.1 inches over and above the stormwater. Uh, so this is an increase in that. And when I talked to the architect about that, the landscape architect, he said, you know, in our world, this is something that we're looking at all the time, using native plants. You know, so it's really nothing different. Um, it's just, you know, showing that you're, you're meeting that. And again, similar to St. Paul, it's recycling 75% of your building debris. And then there was an old building there that we had to demolish, so 75% of that material was recycled. Uh, heat island mitigation. Now, this is a small site. So what they did was add some um, trees near the parking lot, um, overhangs uh, on a building, different type of building materials, you know, that aren't as dark. Um, walkway bike paths, which of course you'd see in a, you know, park, but these are type, the types of things that you have to meet to meet this code. Uh, like pollution control, what I found really um, interesting is that hockey rink. Sometimes you go by a hockey rink in, in, in the middle of winter, and the light's just glaring, you know, and it like shoots out into the neighborhood. Well, this, you go by there, and it's like that light just sh shuts right off, right there. So, you know, creating that um, light pollution control. So radon mitigation, apparently, you know, they, they made sure that the surface was completely uh, sealed. You know, so looking at all these things, um, this has created this green building. So over and above that, how are we doing, what are we doing to promote this code? So in the ordinance back in 2013, there was some language about um, the community development director yearly would take a look at how to incentivize this code to see if we can get um, businesses and uh, residential to voluntarily opt into this. And um, here's some of the things we've done. So a couple energy programs we promoted, Energize Maplewood, and that was um, through a grant from MPCA. Uh, Laura Milberg helped us uh, coordinate that. Um, some of the things we did there was um, we worked with businesses to offer turnkey energy audits, and then this grant helped pay for the energy efficiency improvements and um, benchmarking, got them on the portfolio manager for benchmarking, and then also uh, Energy Star certification. And through that process, you know, we, we were promoting this green building construction code and kind of advertising it through the stories and case studies of these buildings. And then Re-Energize Maplewood, that's something we're doing this year uh, with a grant from um, Metro Clean Energy Resource Team. It's a, a seed grant, and now we're uh, it's kind of the first step in meeting our renewable energy goals with our um, comp plan, and we're doing 
solar feasibility studies for uh, residents and businesses. Um, and then again, use those case studies. And anytime you're promoting this, you're talking about our green building code. So, uh, reduction in residential solar fees. We just did this uh, previously. It was you know based on the value of of the cost of the job. You know, so people were looking at thousands of dollars just for a permit to install solar on their home. So now it's just a flat rate fee of two hundred dollars. Um, Acknowledgement. Um, tomorrow, the city of Maplewood is having the annual State of the City um, luncheon. And during this, we like to acknowledge uh, local businesses. And one of the awards is uh, the Sustainable Business Award. And so we look at um, you know, reduction of waste, um, energy efficiency, things they've done there. And then again, <coughs> any opportunity we can to promote the Green Construction Code. And then, of course, technical guidance. You know, um, just being open and willing to work with developers uh, on the front end, you know, as your the planners are looking at a development proposal, kind of talking about the green construction code and oh, did you know it's pretty easy to follow and there's a lot of recognition and you know, so just uh, being available for that technical guidance I think is really important. So that is a wrap up of the Maplewood Green Building Code and uh, you can find that code on our website um, backslash green building. So check that out. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the International Building Code. Um, so it sounds like it, it applies not only to the structure itself, but the, uh, the site as well. Correct. Stormwater management and so forth. Yeah, I know uh, as an example of that self fire station, uh, you know, one of the performance standards was uh, preserving significant trees, which I'm sure a lot of cities have tree preservation ordinance. But this, you know, was you earn points for doing that. So there were some really large uh, oak trees that, you know, maybe another developer would have developed a certain way uh, where that they would have all been uh, torn down. So we were able to preserve a lot of those beautiful oak trees. So yeah, it's it's interesting and beneficial to take a look at the overall site, not just the building envelope. So I thought it was interesting that you talked specifically about developers really want good partners and they want that technical assistance. They, I mean, they really want to be able to draw on your expertise to help navigate it. Have you thought about hosting sessions specifically for developers or hosting tours of some of your, like, is that helpful or is it really just when they're starting to tackle a project, that's when they want to start to get into the weeds? What's your sense? Uh, you know, every year we have to look for new incentive opportunities and now that we have some uh, case studies out there, that's a great idea to do a tour. But you're right, the developer, um, you know, they're looking at uh, where's the next site. Um, they're looking at, uh, of course, the bottom line, the, the dollar amount. So. Um, I think any time you can make it as uh, easy, um, try to reduce costs by offering that technical guidance, you'll probably have more success. But yeah, it's usually, you know, when they're right there, not something they're, they're going to take a tour of Maplewood to figure out, unless there's a site, they don't want to really, right. yeah. John, what's the tr trigger for private um, uh, development projects in terms of requiring the, uh, any city funding? Okay, like zero, one dollar. Uh, any? Oh, so any level of city funding? Yes. Okay. For a private project? For yes. A project. Yeah. Actually, I should. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but I don't think I saw any kind of. It just said city funding. Oh, okay. City funded. But I don't think if I think they not take the dollar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Instead of funding, have you ever like incorporated it as an incentive in a PE higher density or step back? We have uh, well, we do have a code. It's um, our rural conservation district in South Maplewood. You know the end of that hockey stick. It's pretty rural down there, and um, a couple years ago we created a code 
to um, get more cluster developments because it's probably the only area of Maplewood that there's still some large lots. And one of the, uh, to get smaller lots and more density, one of the uh, standards is to meet the green construction code. So, but yeah, I, I really do like that idea about um, putting that into planned unit developments and certainly something we should look at. But for your cluster ordinance, I mean, that's obviously a Yeah, so you have to meet, hard um, to get certain increased density, you have to meet, I think, like four or five of the standards, preserving natural resources, uh, meeting the building, you know, the green construction code, you know, so you meet maybe five of those and then you can have increased density in that area. So not every city is big enough to have a CURT on staff. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? What is your background, or what kind of learning curve did you find, you know, in terms of learning the language and being able to implement the policy and provide the technical assistance? Um, is that and is that mostly planning staff? Are you seeing building inspectors helping with that, or where where is the technical assistance coming from at this at the end? Uh, I would say our building department. Yeah, you know the things that uh, deal with. The site itself, the planners deal with all the time, you know, curbless surface coverages, uh, tree preservation, you know, so these are things as a planner you normally do, you're just kind of looking at it at a higher level, but it, it's really our building uh, department and it was um, Nick Carver, he was our building official back in 2013, he's the one who really uh, spearheaded this uh, program, so now we're, we're just taking it on for him. <laughs> he, uh, he has since retired. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. Left us with this. Figure out. No, it's been a good program. He was a building official, is that? Correct, yeah. Okay, and then was that based on what he heard from developers coming in, or was that more of just, you know, the conversations he was hearing as educational options? Uh, Nick was the. Uh, Nick. Look <laughs> at Laura. No. He really was involved in um, kind of helping craft uh, many of the codes for the state and at the international level. Maybe a little uh, background. I don't know how familiar you are, otherwise I can give a little background about Please. this. The yeah. International Green Construction Code is one of those model codes um, wow. developed through this whole, you know, stakeholder process, you know, that um, actually internationally, but. Um, a lot of it in the U.S. They go to meetings all around the country, you know, and figure out. Um, when it was first created, it was a collaboration with the U.S. Green Building Council um, to kind of do a stretch code, basically. And for a while, there was a push at the state level with our Department of Labor Industry to try and get that adopted as a stretch code. And then um, they kind of, it was a draft code in some ways. It was the first iteration of it. They decided um, that the new version they came out with, they were going to collaborate with ASHRAE to come out with this new version. And so our state building officials said, well, let's wait on that one. And then it's kind of gone by the wayside with them saying, we can't really do a stretch code without legislative authorization. And that's kind of where it's at right now. And we'll see if anything happens in this legislative session. But, um, but these are two really different approaches. So one is when you're just there, you're using actual code, and so it's your code officials who are implementing a certain code language. And the state Paul ordinance is more a planning department because you're using other programs to do the certification, whereas you're not requiring IGCC certification. You're requiring we've adopted as a city certain parts of this code, and we're enforcing it at our own code level. So it's just two different approaches, and they both have you know, lots of benefits. So just as a follow-up to that, so it sounds like Jason is new in this role. Um, as Jason's know. our new building official. He's been with us for many years, so yeah. But so new to this sort of thing. Yeah. How was, I mean, that transition, it sounds like he was sort of like, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I sort of look at it. I mean, say a little bit more about that process, because I, I hear maybe, I'm inferring in your question, that you're sort of like, hmm, how would that work in another city, and how would our building code folks adopt this sort of approach? So I, I sat down with them yesterday and I said, well, what do you do when this comes in? How do you get the permit? And he showed me this handy little spreadsheet 
that has all of the green construction codes that the city has adopted and how they're implementing them. <laughs> kind of like how Green Stuff Cities works, where you like right. look at it and then you say, Best practices. Check, check, check. <laughs> John, do you think that it would be possible to share that spreadsheet? Well, I said, did you create the spreadsheet or did they? They did. I go, wouldn't it be helpful if we had our own spreadsheet? <laughs> so I'm going to bring that back to them. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll share it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh uh, the developer. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, and along that line, too, Kristen, that thing, too, as um, public entities, too, I think you said finding good partners. I think that's something that we um, really strive, and this is my, my yeah, um, really strive to be a good partner. And I think you should also really be able to expect a lot from those partners. So um, never be. You know, be scared to like lean on you know people who have dedicated their entire education and careers and you know engineers and finance people and you know construction companies and architects and all those types of fields. You know, don't ever fear to just ask a question for technical expertise or anything like that because um, although it might be a first project that you embark on of going down to meet new codes or something, it might be the thousand. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Outstanding. And last but not least, uh, we have the Hennepin from Hennepin County that he's going to talk to us about uh, an innovative program that she's launched. Great program. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I have to sit on this side. I can't move that way. Your head doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't turn that way. Uh, just maybe a little bit of follow up to some of the conversations that's been happening today. But uh, Hennepin County pretty much voluntarily complies to B3 on all our buildings. And so anything over 10,000 square feet or greater, we try to do all the voluntary. We're not necessarily officially uh, you know, entering all our data and, being, and having to be in compliance, but what we do is we try to tell our consultants that are designing the projects, we want you to comply to everything in V3 unless you can give us a good reason why you can't. So uh, from a voluntary standpoint, there's always the opportunity for individual you know, organizations to be able to voluntarily comply to that. And, it, and I'm really interested in the fact that no one has brought up any of the utility programs that are often there too. And we often, we also require that any Hennepin County building has to go through the Energy Design Assistance Program, which is another good opportunity for cities to require the utility programs to be utilized in their, their building programs, because I think that that is a, a huge service, plus there's a lot of incentives and money that we are receiving through those programs. So just a background information that kind of ties into that. We're going to shift gears a little bit, because this is a program that could possibly supplement uh, your energy uh, building code opportunities. So at Hinman County, we have, we're in the process of rolling out a building energy benchmarking collaborative. And a couple things just to keep, you know, to kick off right now is, you know, Hinman County, this is, this is one of my brainchild ideas. I think that it's a really great opportunity for people to benchmark their buildings. And, you know, one of the reasons that one, but you know, one of the reasons really here is you know, to measure is to know, and if you cannot measure, you cannot improve it. And this is really the foundation for most buildings out there is to really know how much energy you're using. You won't know if you're doing good, if you're doing bad, if you don't start measuring it. So, we really think that the foundation is an energy benchmarking program established for your city, for your um, community, and we're really trying to push and make this a little bit more. Uh, user-friendly for the smaller cities. You know, the, the bigger cities often can have the resources, but a lot of the smaller cities do not have the resources to actually implement any benchmarking program. 
which is why Hennepin County has come to, to, into the mix. But we'll get into that a little bit more. I want to just kind of talk a little bit about why energy benchmarking is important. You know, there's a lot of different criteria that you can use to, to design your building to. And we've seen a lot of these buildings be designed to these criteria. And these are great things to design to. The problem is, is you can design to them, and that's one thing, but if they're actually operating and actually using the same energy that you designed to is a completely different aspect to it. And a lot of those standards are now starting to recognize that and, and requiring that you do some ongoing uh, tracking of your energy use. But on this particular chart, you can see that there's quite a few buildings there that aren't even meeting base code. And they're originally designed as lead buildings. And this was from 2009. So, I mean, this is almost, this is 10 years old already, so you can only imagine what this number would look like 10 years, you know, in the current days. But there's still quite a few buildings that have the all intention of being energy efficient, but then are not actually meeting those goals. So, you know, tracking your, your, your energy use and actually seeing what your buildings are, are using is, is critical. And you know, we, we happen to have experienced this ourselves at Hennepin County where we had uh, a LEED certified building that um, wasn't even close to meeting an energy star score. It was more than 25. I don't even know if I want to say that, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, but you know, that, it gives us the reason to ask the question why. So, so really what is benchmarking? It's really about, you know, measuring your energy performance of your buildings. And, you know, a lot of people are getting into water benchmarking too, which I think is very, uh, beneficial, especially for cities, because cities are oftentimes providing their own water use. Um, a lot of people use Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's a great tool when the federal government is operating. All right now it is shut down, unfortunately, but um, I don't anticipate that to be last, last very long time. A uh, free online tool, which is great, and it's kind of across the board been a tool that's been used throughout the United States. Um, I know that the city of you know, we, we also have our own B3 benchmarking tool here too, which does talk to Energy Star, so there is some, some opportunities to collaborate with that. Uh, you do get a score from one to 100, so hopefully people can understand that, you know, if your building is a one, it's not doing very good. If your building is a 100, it's doing great. <laughs> They're trying to really make it easy for you to understand how your building is doing based on giving you a one to 100 score. Many people recognize that. It's something that's actually become more common in the industry. And then, you know, it, it, the disclosure part is oftentimes the, the next step up from a benchmarking program. You can benchmark your own buildings. You can benchmark your buildings against the own building on uh, over time. You can benchmark your buildings throughout the uh, region or a community. And you can also disclose your energy to the region and the community and the public. And that's taking your energy benchmarking to the next step. And that's making it available to people that want to know, hey, is this building that I'm going to buy energy efficient? Is this building that I'm renting from energy efficient? You know, that it gives them the tools to be able to make those decisions. And also, it also gives a little bit of competitive competition to other building managers because they understand that people are going to start looking at that. They're going to pick, you know, energy efficient building A over non-energy efficient building B just because of that is a priority for them. So just to be clear, the program that we're rolling out is intended to provide services for cities that want to implement their own energy benchmarking program for their community buildings, their public buildings, or non-public buildings. Most communities now in the state of Minnesota can publicly disclose their buildings if they're a public building already through the B3 program. This is to take it one step farther and actually incorporate, you know, commercial buildings, multifamily, um, other light industry buildings that are actually non, not public buildings, private sector buildings. So it's not to say that public buildings cannot take part in this. That is always encouraged. The more buildings, the better, and you'll see why as we move forward. But it really is geared towards getting those private sector buildings to start reporting. So. So you can see that there's a lot of energy benchmarking programs out there, and this is already becoming two years outdated, and so it's hard to keep up with these, with these slides. But um, you know, some are more statewide. You can see Minnesota right now has got a, a statewide program. 
uh, which is a V3 program, and then we have a, a city of Minneapolis right now with, from what I can hear, a handful of other cities throughout the state of Minnesota that are hoping to jump on board on this bandwagon shortly. So, again, city of Minneapolis has got theirs. They've been going on for, I think, it's about five years. And then the V3 benchmarking one, where I think most people are familiar with, is something that you can participate in. So really, what are the benefits? Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but you know, helping building owners know their energy, their energy performance in the building is really huge. And you know, we oftentimes think that that is a bad thing, but oftentimes it's a really good thing. And you know, Hennepin County has had the great experience of knowing that we we're doing good in a lot of our buildings, and we're getting recognized for that. So that's great. Um, and then, you know, if you're not doing so great, you have opportunities, right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's just opportunities. Um, it also does support the Minneapolis Green Step Cities program, so I think it can help you get to the next step. Um, it supports a lot of cities' climate action plans, and it, it does create a building peer comparison, so a little bit of competition, um, and it creates uh, programs for energy efficiency. So if you get a demand for more people want to do energy efficiency, it oftentimes is creating more demand for that. And then obviously, we get a lot of support from Excel Energy, Center Point Partners in Energy Program. So a lot of that all kind of ties together. They're doing a lot of great things to help support this program. We do see some great savings just from implementing an energy benchmarking program. We're not doing anything else. We're not saying you have to do energy efficiency. We're not doing anything else. We're just saying you need to be aware of how much energy you're using. And you can see that you know, throughout the nation, and again, these numbers are already old. So throughout the you know, nation, we're seeing about a you know two percent average. I think the city of Minneapolis was still trying to get their on board. A lot of times, they were just public sector buildings for the first couple of years. So um, still trying to get caught up, but um, some really great opportunities, even with that small percentage that Minneapolis is seeing, which isn't as great as the nationwide. We're still seeing some really good opportunities for just cost savings. I mean, you know, water reduction is 12%, but you know, the utility spend savings is 2.4 million dollars a year. So, you're just implementing a building energy benchmarking program can really impact the savings that your buildings might see in your greenhouse gases, and your energy, and your costs. So, you know, one of the things we recognize is that we don't have um, oftentimes the FTEs to implement a program like this, and they do take some time. Um, generally, we see about you know, one and a half full-time FTEs needed to implement a program like this. That's kind of based off of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, there's a lot to be done, policy, outreach, technical assistance for the building managers, holding their hands, making sure they understand what that is. And one of the biggest things we see is quality control on the data. I mean, garbage in is garbage out. We've heard that a million times. Obviously, we need to have someone checking that data to make sure that it is in the ballpark. And then you know, trying to get those resources out to the people that actually need them and they have opportunities, right? So we decided let's try and bring all that together and try and help people throughout. Um, we're, granted, this is a Henry County program. We are offering this service to anyone in the state of Minnesota. So it's, it's going to be based on uh, you know, a collaborative purchasing agreement, but Really, we're trying to give some of those resources to everyone through a purchasing agreement, and we're pulling, pulling every opportunity for all the cities to be able to take advantage of this throughout the region, and then trying to pull all this data into one space so that a uh, building owner can go in there and take a look at their data. If they're the target to the world, they can see it throughout the whole entire state, not having to go to each individual city's you know, website and collect data from it. So really good opportunity to, to see how we can pull this all together from a statewide perspective. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to standardize the process. We don't want everyone that wants to implement an energy benchmarking program to have a different day of compliance or a different method of compliance. So we're trying to standardize on the process. We're trying to share resources. You know, we can bring in a lot of different cities to do this. We can share from there different experiences. We're trying to create some tools for implementation. Everyone can use the same tools. And then we're trying to make this economically feasible. So obviously, the more cities we can get on board, uh, the, the, the lower the price becomes for these services. Oops. 
I guess it's kind of delayed. <laughs> going to stop there. I don't know if that was a late slide, but <clears throat> so you know some of the things that we're going to require to make sure that this is a standardized process, make sure people are using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, nationwide free program, great for the public. C3 written right now is only offered to the public building sector free. So private buildings would actually have to pay for that. So that's one of the downsides of that. Energy Star Portfolio Manager is offered free to everyone. Um, June 1st reporting date, that's pretty common throughout the nation to have at least the initial reporting date of June 1st. You can always have that, oh crap, I didn't meet that date, backup plan. <laughs> but um, usually the first date is always that one. You'll get your notice that you didn't comply. You have another you know, follow-up date to comply, and usually there's a couple phases to that. We will have some ability to have you know, data transparency be a little bit flexible. Some cities are going to want certain things. Um, Public, some are going to want others public, so we have a little bit of flexibility on that. Um, building use, type and size, some cities are going to have more multifamily. They're going to want to focus on their multifamily. Some are going to have more commercial buildings. You know, they're going to have smaller commercial buildings. They're going to have larger commercial buildings. So that's going to be somewhat flexible. And then really phase compliance. Some people are going to decide their first year is going to be voluntary. Some people are going to say that only public buildings need to comply the first year. There's multiple different ways to phase in this process. I think just getting your feet wet and getting the first phase in is the key step. Um, trying to fight off something that's manageable is huge. So we do have some of the partners in this. Would be Obviously, we're going to be working with the cities to implement this and pass their ordinance. We're going to be working with the building owners to actually input their data. And then we have the overlay consulting. And overlay consulting is really our technical services consultants that we contracted with that we're going to make available to all the cities that want to implement an energy building um, benchmarking ordinance. And I'm going to go through some of the work that overlay consulting is going to be providing. And I might skim over it kind of fast because I know we're running out of time. But you know, really, they're going to be the technical support for the program, and they're going to be doing a lot of the, the behind-the-scenes work. So, and I just wanted to mention that Hennepin County, as part of this program, we've already you know provided all the, the startups, so we've created the program. We did that in conjunction with Midnight uh, Foundation funding, and then the ongoing program costs will be a result of the cities having to pay for it. But we've seen that cost be reduced because a lot of this upfront establishment of the program has already been covered through Hennepin County and the McKnight Foundation. So what we're doing is we're recognizing that cities are going to have different needs for different things at different times, and we're more or less saying that we're going to provide five different services through our overlay consulting contract. You can pick what ones you need, when you need them, how, how much you need. So we kind of have an a la carte for the different five scopes. So you know, some cities are going to have more internal staff that can do some of these things themselves. Some are going to have no internal staff need to contract it all out. So we want to make sure it's somewhat flexible for the different sizes of the cities. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty fast just to be cognizant of time. But you know, obviously, scope one is getting billing data and trying to get uh, establish what that that timeline or that that policy might look like. Is it you know? Every building over 50,000 square feet, commercial building, that type of stuff. Trying to get some of those building IDs tracked, get them into the system, just getting them started. Uh, there's going to be a lot of outreach that needs to be done to the building owners, trying to get them understanding what you know this requirement is, get them set up with Energy Star, do some training, that type of stuff. That's going to be another scope that people can they contract with. There's going to be a lot of data coming in. Uh, work with them to you know coordinate with Excel Energy and CenterPoint are both you know pretty much allowing this service to happen automatic, but trying to get those set up, working with those um, and getting all that data in from from the, the cities. I just have a quick question: with the automatic uploads in Excel are they doing that directly? Yes. Okay. Yep. And CenterPoint, I think, is right behind, or maybe even be really close to doing that. So. So then, obviously, we're going to have you know questions that are coming through. Um, 
all the tracking of the, you know, who's in compliance, who they've talked to, what questions have come through. A lot of that is going to be behind the scenes, you know, call center, emails, webinars, all that type of stuff. All is going to be something we can provide as a service. I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, there's a, so Overlay Consulting will be tracking all this information. They'll know exactly who they're contacting, what buildings are, are in there, and they, they use a, a program called Salesforce. So we have a lot of that data up front tracked. This is probably one of the, the biggest headaches of this program is tracking that. I know a lot of people have tried to use an Excel spreadsheet and ultimately failed. <laughs> so, um, you know, using something that is a software program that's kind of designed for this purpose is, is really makes it a lot cleaner. Um, you can run reports at any point in time for any city that they need it. We can send out automated reports to every city depending on what information they need. There's a lot of QA, QC checks, um, just trying to see if there's an extra zero at the end of your utility, you know, data. <laughs> Never happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, I've, I found a couple of things where I missed a zero. So sometimes there's pros and cons to that, but um, yeah, all that you know, exemption forms, all that gets tracked by this program too. And then we have once we have all that data cleared and it's <coughs> cleaned up, we have the reporting. So providing that information to the you know, to the cities, to the public, is all part of that process. And we've got a couple different ways that we do that. One, we report back to each building owner via a scorecard, so they can actually see how their building is doing <coughs> in comparison to other buildings, in comparison to themselves, uh, provide some information on resources that they can tap into if they feel they have opportunities. We will, we're creating, well, we already have a GIS map that all this building data is gonna be going into, and so if someone can link to the GIS map open that GIS map, content is the whole entire state of Minnesota, so any buildings you know, throughout the state can, can be looked up via different filtering aspects. You can filter by city, you can filter by commercial building type, you can you know, filter by size. All that's going to be available with some high-level information in there for um, building owners and, and the public to see. It's kind of a little bit bigger visual of what that is intended to look like. And then, you know, obviously every city is going to have the opportunity to be able to modify what data they want public to some extent, but, you know, a lot of the basic scores and building um, information will be on that. So those are concepts that doesn't exist yet? Well, we have this design <coughs> and it's ready. It, yeah. This is probably not the final version yet, so it's actually kind of in its final process right now. So they're finalizing it. The issue is that Energy Star is shut down right now, so we can't pull any data into the GIS actual map right now. So once Energy Star is back up and running, we should be able to have all this live data. <laughs> so I know I uh, but anyway. <laughs> And then the last scope of work is really trying to get out there and publicize the opportunities and the resources that are there, try to create some efficiency programs. And I think this is where this really does tie into a lot of the goals that the cities have here with the, the, the different building codes and the different um, climate action plans. Oh no! Okay, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> it's slow, so I can it was a process. So I'm way down there, but I'll tell you what. Do you know what approximate? Show me which slide. It's like the, one of the last ones. Okay. We're really close to the last one. Up two, couple more. It's that one. This one. Huh? Oh, I didn't like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Up. I have a quick question. It's so, a good question. Sure, go for it. So I wonder, I mean, I was thinking today, so we walked walk through the sort of St. Paul example and the Maplewood example. So say you had people go through that process. Maybe as you provided an incentive, you also said, and we'd like you to participate in this disclosure process. So now you would see that they both used something to build to a green standard, and you could track over time which as long as everything was built the way we wanted it to and operate, it's almost like a reminder. They went through this program and look at how well that building is doing over time, 
right? It's sort of like the public nudge of. You're basically explaining this slide right here. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> 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 I want to make sure I, <laughs> I, I, make sure I tied in the importance of an energy benchmarking to you know policy. And we do have a couple of op, you know opportunities. Obviously, green building grants, energy efficiency grants would be a good way to tie into this. If you're participating in this benchmarking program, then you maybe get an extra incentive on a grant, or you get an eligibility for grants. You know that's one opportunity. These are just examples, right? Um, you know, obviously, better in building energy compliance. Anyone that you know is possibly maybe not meeting this particular threshold, or is part of this requirement, has some sort of energy building, energy compliance. Um, awards and recognition are ones that we oftentimes forget to think about, but Oftentimes, disclosing your energy use is actually a really good thing. And you can get awards, you can get recognition. This is something that people would like to see. I think it's something that people can promote in uh, you know, selling their building and their tenant spaces. So, and then this annual tracking of green buildings. So, you know, let's say you do have a green building code or policy, you can use this to track that over time and see if they're you know, staying consistent with what their intent of that building use was. We could, you know, maybe create some audits and opportunity evaluations and tie into rebate programs, like I kind of talked about. Lots of opportunities there if they're complying with the energy benchmarking program or if they're required by a benchmarking program. There's just some really creative ways to, to be thinking about this. And then, you know, one of the ones that's been really kind of coming up, especially at the city of Minneapolis, is truth in housing and energy rating disclosures. I mean, when you go to buy a house, when you go to rent a, a place, sign a lease, all that's given to you up front. So there's no question about you know, how much energy your building is going to be using. And you can keep that in mind. Maybe you're paying that utility bill. You know, maybe you just want to be in a green home. You know, maybe you want to make sure that your, your rent doesn't skyrocket for some particular reason. So a lot of these things are kind of coming up as uh, these programs become more established and uh, you know, creative ideas are being brought forward. Let's see if I can try this again. So I wanted to just throw in this slide. You can obviously, these slides are going to be handed out to you, but it does give you a rough idea of what the pricing is. And we tried to price this based off of uh, how many buildings you think that you're going to have in compliance with this program. So obviously, smaller cities will be paying less. Larger cities will be paying more. Here's another uh, example of what that breakdown is and the ongoing fee. So you'll have this as a, as a resource. And there's a requirement. So for a, a city that would pass a benchmarking ordinance, there would be, the minimum would be a one-time fee, it looks like, of 8000 Yeah. Okay. Just to, to use the platform. Yep. To be able to use the platform. Okay. Yeah. Usually that minimum is just to start up, get those buildings put into our program. You know, if you don't need your buildings in the program, then that might be a different avenue. I know that there's a couple cities that don't want to use anything but our GIS map. You know, if it's just the GIS map, then then there's some interesting opportunities. You might not have to pay that startup fee because you're not going to be putting it into our sales force. We don't have to give billing IDs. You've already done all that. You just basically want to take data and put it into a GIS format. Oh. That that's one opportunity. Okay. So you know, there's there's a little bit of flexibility in here. You know, really, this is here to support programs, not to make you find of fitting into our idea of what we thought was going to be a really good idea. Oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, keep that in mind. But, yeah, generally if you are going to be doing that, just to start up with getting all your buildings identified and put into the system is going to be that startup fee of about $8,000. Uh, this is, you know, approximately what we're shooting for for time frames. Um, we've done, we have three, four pilot cities that we're working with right now, and we're working to get their ordinances hopefully passed here. Maybe for a June 2019. I mean, June, wow, it's coming up a little fast, right? Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people are considering a voluntary program or maybe just a public sector program where you know a shorter frame of notice isn't going to be as detrimental, and then they can kick off with a more you know commercial building wide uh, one for next year. But at least they're getting their feet wet and you know figuring out all the wrinkles and identifying all that stuff. So. You know, for the people that hope that they can get a uh, building ordinance passed in 2019, um, we're ready to go. You know, I would say that the, the program is pretty much set up. We have a little glitch with the EPA, but hopefully that'll be uh, over soon and we can be moving. 
So again, you know, next steps, I know a lot of people have either considered this or have some goals in their account plans that this would help support. Um, city council budget and approval is obviously a, a big hurdle. Uh, passing the ordinance at the bottom is yet another big hurdle. And we've been working with the Center for Energy and Environment and GPI to kind of help with some of that process. Um, and then assessing your building stack and really trying to figure out what, you know, what's going to work best for you to get your biggest bang for your buck for how many people are reporting versus how much you know energy savings or building fleet you're covering. So here's my building info or my information and last time I Googled Henry County benchmarking came up as our website, so that's always good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you can always contact me if you're interested in this program, and we can give you more information about it and how you can get started. So, yeah. can you can you tell us who the pilot cities are? Should be able to. Uh, City of St. Paul is a pilot. They're pretty far along with their passing their ordinance, which is great. Uh, Edina, St. Louis Park, and then Eden Prairie. And what I mean, you said that some of them are thinking public buildings, maybe to start, but then. Beyond that, in the private sector, what what kinds of conversations are people having about what to target? Well, so I know right now, state, you know, city of St. Paul has got a voluntary program already established, and so they're volunteer. I think they had 150 buildings. I wish Kurt was still here. Uh, voluntarily comply last year. This year, they're trying to make it more robust and actually have a compliance program. And a lot of people are are focusing on commercial buildings in the larger cities. The city of um, Edina and St. Louis Park are strongly looking at multifamily and commercial because multifamily is such a huge part of those more suburban uh, rings of the, the city, the metro area. So I would say that multifamily is becoming now one of the, you know, the, the primary focuses on a lot of these energy benchmarking programs in addition to commercial buildings. I also throw in their light industry because people tend to say nothing to industry, but we've actually seen that light industry means a warehouse. So, I mean, warehouses are great opportunities for energy savings. Um, there's usually a lot of really simple low hanging fruit in warehouses and um, really good bang for your buck. So, I think light industry is also a, a really big ticket item. And, it, and it, every city has a different classification for what light industry is and what a warehouse is. Some people consider it commercial, some people consider it light industry. So it's, it's all over the map, but I'd really encourage people to at least find out where that breakpoint even is and, and try and get you know, the warehouses of the world in, into that mix. So. So, so just like B3, one would be able to pick in this platform of private buildings, uh, a class of buildings, so um, multifamily or um, high rises. Or yep. Yep. Yeah. And would you be go able to go a step further and see what kind of, say, in a commercial building, what kind of activities they're doing because then, you know, you might have a place that has like big data uh, operations, you know, like, um, and that's going to increase their energy use. You might have another office yes. that's just like the same uh, size. Yes. You know. <laughs> well, and that's the whole controversy about whether we, wh whether we display the Energy Star score versus the Energy Use Intensity score first, because Energy Star actually does take that portion of the data center into consideration, longer hours of operation, all of those kind of characteristics of a building use are taken into consideration when they do do an energy star score. So it does even the playing field a little bit versus if we just gave them an EUI. You know, obviously an EUI for a building that's open 24-7 should be higher than one that's only open five days a week for eight hours. So there, there's some pros and cons to all those type of situations, but we don't anticipate that we're going to be using dis disclosing anything about what's actually happening in there. That's a very sensitive subject for home building owners, they don't want to disclose that. They don't even want to disclose the name of the building most of the time. So, which, you know, we've been working with them on. Um, so there's, there's some very sensitivity around the data portion of that, but um, 
we're definitely trying to be cognizant of that too. So yeah, probably not going to be disclosing what is happening in that building. Now, when you're inputting the data, um, like the utility information, um, is it coming from like smart meters from the building that the meter can go directly into like an energy star or this, or is it the utility gives you the energy information and then you take the, like, the utility bill and input that? Yeah, it's based off the utility bill information. Okay, so it's the bill, it's yep. not a meter. It's mm -hmm. not a smart meter. Okay. Um, all you know, Excel automatically has a, a function that already auto uploads it into uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager, mm -hmm. and CenterPoint's on the verge of rolling that out, if I remember right. So, there, the kind of eliminates once you get it set up. There's not much you have to do. You right. set that automated function up, and then you just basically leave it for the year. And at the end of the year, when we send you a request to submit your data, you submit your data. The only other thing that's probably going to be manually entered is water. And um, I don't see, haven't heard of any opportunities to automate that anytime soon. Um, but most cities are requiring that, you know, most of the cities that are requiring this program are actually providing water at some point in time. So there is some ability that maybe the cities could provide that information automatically at some point in time. So. Yeah. Most, volunteers. most are not voluntary. Most have fees. If you don't meet compliance, you will have to pay a fee. So, and those fees are all over the map. Some are on a, you didn't meet this date, we're going to charge you this much every day after you don't meet the compliance date. And some are, okay, you didn't, you didn't meet the compliance date, you know, I'm going to give you a warning two months later. Oh, you didn't meet it. All right, I'm going to charge you $200. Oh, you still didn't meet it. Oh, that's all right. Here's a $1,000 fine. Oh, you still didn't. Well, you know, we just, we're not going to actually give you the fine, but we're going to make sure that you actually do the work. So some of the fines are just more of a threat and not actually enforced. Um, some of them are enforced, you know, the day after they're on them. So, and then some of them are voluntary programs. So it, it just kind of depends. We do know that if it's a voluntary program that you get a compliance rate more around 60%, maybe. And if it's um, something that has a fee or any sort of penalty to it, you're going to get closer to 90 to 95% compliance, which is actually really good compliance rate. So highly encourage some sort of fee um, that's associated with not compliance. <coughs> so it does really make a difference where you slice and dice your building fleet because obviously, you know, 50,000 square feet is a really good number for commercial buildings. You might have, you know, 100 buildings that you can, that have to be in compliance. You drop that down to 25, you might have 500 buildings that have to be in compliance, but you're really only gaining 3% more square footage on your compliance for building compliance. So a lot of that is to be taken into consideration, and we've been seeing that as we're evaluating the pilot cities. Where is that break-even point? How much more paperwork do you want to do for a small amount of additional square footage? So. Awesome. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who's here. Thank you, everybody who's online. And uh, remember to submit those Green Set City surveys. And uh, we'll get out this information to you. Uh, shortly. So thanks everybody. Thank Have a great you. day. Thank you.